Right. Um, hello, uh, Year 11, uh, and anyone else who would care to, to join us, I suppose. Um, Shumai, my name is Mr. Red, and uh, I'm going to be taking you through um, stars and planets today, uh, another uh, Year 11 physics topic. So we're going to jump straight in and um, look at what we're going to be covering today. So first of all, um, the main features of our solar system, uh, the order, size, uh, orbit and composition to include the sun, terrestrial planets, gaseous giants, uh, giant planets, sorry, uh, dwarf planets, comets, moons and asteroids. And there's a huge amount in there, OK, um, which we'll pick apart now. We'll talk about all those um, different things. You'll know a lot of them already, I'm sure, um, but there might be a few in there that you're a little bit uncertain about. Um, and then the second learning objective then for today is all about um, the structure of the universe. Know, um, what a galaxy is in relation to the solar system and how we measure distances in space as well. OK, let's get into it then. So first of all, you're going to need to know the order of the planets in the solar system, including, of course, um, uh, mentioning the fact that the solar system contains the sun as well. All right. So in the question of what is in the solar system, don't forget to mention the sun, because sometimes students tend to reel off the planets, but forget that um, important part. OK, so you're going to need to think of a mnemonic uh, to help you remember the order of the planets, because it literally could be a question, you know, um, what is the third rock from the sun? or What's the third planet from the sun? You're going to need to know that you're going to need a system. OK, now a mnemonic is um, like a little word play thing that allows you to take the first letter of each word in, in a crazy sentence. Um, so um, the one I've got here is uh, many very empty monkeys just scoffed unhealthy naturals. And if you take the first letter of each of those, uh, M for the first one, Mercury, V, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and then Neptune. Okay, You'll notice Pluto's not on the list. Um, Pluto was declassified as a planet. Um, a lot of smart astronomers got together one day and had a chat about um, Pluto and decided it wasn't a planet anymore. All right, so don't forget to leave that one off. There are eight, pla eight, eight planets now, all right? Um, so you think of your own mnemonic as a challenge for after the session, okay? In case you already haven't done it, I can still remember the one that I made up when I did my GCSEs. And I'm not going to even tell you what it is because it's so stupid. OK, um, so that's the order of the planets. And um, you'll notice that uh, there are some big differences between them. OK, especially the inner ones. Now, these first four, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, we call these terrestrial planets. Don't freak out about the word terrestrial. Are we all good, um, Mr. Nettle, everything going all right? Perfect, great, thank you. So these are the terrestrial planets, um, rocky planets. Don't be put off by that word. Then, of course, the, the next four, we call these, sometimes the gassy giants, OK? Um, but these are gassy planets, obviously giant because they're so much bigger than the inner planets, OK? All right. Now, there's something quite wrong about that um, diagram. If I just go back for a second, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things very wrong about it. OK, first of all, um, what's not really apparent there is the scale. So um, the scale of the planets in terms of their size um, will look quite different to how you see it in a lot of textbooks. So, for example, Earth, I've just marked on there, you are here um, in relation to Jupiter is considerably smaller. You can see um, Jupiter, uh, Jupiter just, um, hang on, let me get my pen work in a second. Just in case you weren't sure, Jupiter is this one, OK? Oh, that's Jupiter. And then, of course, Saturn with the amazing uh, ring system. OK, if you ever get the opportunity to look at Saturn through a telescope, I highly recommend you do so. It is quite an incredible sight to see for the first time. But what's even more surprising then is, of course, um, you've got the smaller planets down here. So you've got uh, Mercury. Um, you've got Mars, which is quite small. Next to it, I should get a different color highlighter, really, shouldn't I? Yeah. Uh, let's get a, a nice green. Yes, yeah, so you've got Mars just here, all right? And then Venus, sister planet to Earth, okay? But look at the sun, which is this guy over here, all right? 
just look at the size of the sun in comparison to the Earth. So that's something you often see on diagrams. Um, so the scale is very, very different. Also, um, the distances between the planets, you can't show it on a diagram because the distances between the planets are vast. All right. Um, and it's something that's fun to go into, but maybe not for now. All right. Now, also within the solar system, as well as the planets and the, and, um, and the sun, we have dwarf planets. And here are just a few which are named. You don't need to know the names of the dwarf planets. OK, um, but you just need to know that they exist. So they are essentially very, very small planets, which we don't really classify as fully grown or proper planets. All right. So we don't tend to include them in the list. But there are, importantly, other large bodies out there that orbit the sun as well. Um, so another one of that on that list was, um, uh, you know, um, the term asteroid and what an asteroid is. So these are large, uh, rocky, metallic objects. They're not as big as planets. OK, um, they can be anything from, you know, uh, a meter wide up to you name it, maybe, you know, close to a thousand kilometers. OK, and they also orbit the sun. Um, but they um, they do so in one kind of region. Now, there are asteroids scattered throughout the solar system, but mainly where we find asteroids is in what we call the asteroid belt. And I'm just trying to think if I got a, a place where they'd be. No, I haven't. Right. So the asteroid belt, um, if we're to mark it on the pen, is located between Mars and Jupiter. OK, so that's where we've got this band of uh, of asteroids. OK, and there is some suggestion that Jupiter might have had something to do with creating the asteroid uh, belt as well due to its large gravity. Now, um, this uh, slideshow is going to be um, put up online for you to view. I would urge you to go back to the slide. You'll have a look through it and play this video. It's about um, uh, an asteroid that um, burns up in the atmosphere and actually hit the ground, became a meteor. We'll talk about that in just a moment um, over Russia. And there's lots of really cool footage. It's one of the largest asteroids to um, be recorded entering the Earth's atmosphere for quite some time. So go back and watch that at your leisure. Um, oh, there it is. Look, so there's the asteroid belt. I did include it. So that's, as I said, in between Mars and Jupiter, all those rocks orbit in the sun. OK, um, so what is a meteor then? Well, a meteor is very much like an asteroid. The difference is that a meteor is an asteroid, if you imagine, that makes it to the surface of a planet or a moon. So if you were to find a lump of rock that had entered the Earth's atmosphere from space, it might have once been an asteroid when it was floating around in space, but because it's on the Earth's surface, it would now be a meteor. OK. And um, yeah, there's an example. There's one image of a meteor uh, just there. You can see, OK, and um, we've got, um, oh, yeah, a hole in the ground where a meteor struck the ground as well. All right. And um, there's not much more to say about meteors it's other than um, they can come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, OK, because asteroids can come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. So here is an example of a, a meteorite crater. OK. Um, and here's one in northern Arizona in America. Um, and there's some estimates there to how fast it was going, when it happened. And uh, yeah, uh, suffice to say that were you uh, to observe that event uh, 50,000 years ago, um, it would have been quite an epic sight. Now, uh, the moon has got loads of evidence of um, uh, a hostile solar system and it is covered in craters from meteorites that have struck its surface um, and you know a lot of those um, might have hit the earth and caused a lot of damage so the moon has taken a lot of hits for the team go moon comets so uh what is a comet i'm glad you asked a comet is a um it's a lump of ice and rock and it's um, a bit like an asteroid in the sense that it orbits the sun but it's got um Listen to this, it's got a really elongated elliptical orbit. What on earth is that, Mr. Red? I'm glad you asked again. A circular orbit, we're all right with that. We know what a circle looks like. Um, an elongated elliptical orbit is like a really squashed circle. I think of like a rugby ball, okay? And um, 
you know, in fact, all of the planets um, orbit in a sort of an elliptical fashion, okay? But um, in the case of a comet, it's really stretched out. Comets also have uh, a tail. And the reason why they have a tail is that, uh, is, well, is because when it become, when it come, when a comet comes close to the sun, and the sun heats up that comet, okay, and vaporizes it, okay? If you like, it blasts and heats um, some of the matter, some of the ice off the surface of the comet, and it creates this cool sort of tail type um, uh, appearance, okay? And it's just basically the ionization of the gas, okay? It's um, it, it, that creates that light. And importantly as well, the tail always points away from the sun because the sun is always blasting that matter off into space. It's always got, a comet's always got its tail pointing away from the sun. There's some famous comets I thought I'd mention quickly. Uh, Halley's Comet is um, probably the most famous. It visits every, uh, I think it's every sort of 75 years, I think it is. Um, Halley's Comet or Halley's Comet, it's called sometimes, okay. Um, and it's you can see its orbit on the right here, okay. Uh, you can see that's the orbit of um, Halley's Comet. You can see it um, uh, crossing the orbits of lots of other planets, all right, on its route back in towards the center of the solar system uh, and the sun. And you can see the years as well there. So it, it last visited in something like, oh, I think it's like 1985 or something. No, but yeah, yeah, about 1985 is when we saw it last. Um, and it won't be back until, let's see, something like 2060. Yeah, about 2060 it will come back. So something to look out for, hey, fun times ahead. Um, but yeah, it's quite a sight, quite a spectacle. On the right, you've got the Bayer Tapestry, right? The Bayer Tapestry was, um, you know, uh, a tapestry which was sewn to commemorate the Battle of Hastings, something which you've done in history. But within that tapestry, they've even got reference to um, Halley's Comet. Isn't that incredible? If you actually do the years, if you take 75 years off um, and you get back to 1066, um, this thing was visited um, around the time of that conquest. So um, they thought it was pretty cool. I don't think they knew what it was. Of course, they didn't know what it was. They would have thought it was something fantastic, like a sign from God or, I don't know, some bad omen, maybe. Who knows? But, um, yeah, it's uh, it's been with us for a long time. Uh, and that's the comment I saw. And Mr. Nettle would have seen this one as well, I think, just about. Or uh, maybe it might have been a bit too young. <laughs> Hale Bob visited in 1995. And um, you're going to have to wait a while for that one because Hale Bob's not going to come back for uh, another 2,530 years. So of a long wait. Okay, so important questions then. This is point number two now on our learning checklist. What is a light year? What is an astronomical unit or AU? Why do we have these different units? I hear you ask. Well, we'll start off by uh, asking a, a question. How far is it to London? Now, obviously, you're in different parts of Wales and we're all in different parts of Wales here, but from where I am um, in, in Bridgend, it's around about 241,800, no, 241 million, I beg your pardon, 800,000 millimeters away. Now, I think we can all agree that that's just a bit silly, isn't it? It's a really dumb way of, of quoting that distance. And uh, the reason is, is that a millimeter is like tiny, isn't it? And the distance from here to London is, is Miles and miles and miles. It's a, you know, it's around about 180 miles. Okay, so it would be really daft, wouldn't it, to quote a distance like that? Okay, uh, because you're using a silly unit of measurement. So whenever we're measuring distances, we have to use an appropriate unit of measurement. So I just want to have a look at these images for a second. All right, and I wonder if you can tell me or pop in the chat. See if anyone gets this right. What do you think the definition of an astronomical unit is? So here, look, we've got um, an image which is going to help you come up with an, a, a definition of what an, astronom an astronomical unit is. What do you think in words? How would you describe what an astronomical unit is? And if you've had a go at that, I wonder if you can describe as well what a light year is. Now, 
we're not in real time. We're a little bit ahead of you, okay? Um, but when those questions and those answers come in, it'd be good to check them out at the end. So see if you can just jot them in, right? Can you tell me on those images what you think those quantities are? Okay. Right. Anyway, we're going to move on now, so we've got a delay. But I'd love to see if anyone answers that in the chat uh, when we get to the end. Right, um, so what is an astronomical unit? I wonder if you got this. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, we say average distance because remember I said that orbits aren't perfectly circular. Some of them are slightly squashed, right? They're, they're elliptical. So over the course of the year, as we go around the Sun, our distance from the Sun fluctuates by a small amount, okay? So it's the average distance from the Earth to the Sun. So one astronomical unit is 150 million meters or 150, um, uh, 150 sorry, million uh, kilometers. That's wrong, that is. That's 150 million meters. That there is wrong. Bad, Mr. Red. I am so sorry. Okay, 150 million kilometers. Um, now, the thing you need to know, though, is that, importantly, a national unit is the distance, the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, and you need to know um, the reason why we use such a measurement, okay? And it's because the distances in our solar system are so big. Right. Our next one, a light year. Now, you probably guessed this as well. A light year is the distance that light travels in a year. Don't be fooled by the fact that it says light year, because it makes you think of time, okay? But it's not time. It's the distance that light travels in a year. It's 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters, which is a baffling number, huge number, huge number. Um, and we use light years to measure distances beyond our solar system. More on that in a moment. OK, so we're now going to look at, um, I guess, the structures of uh, the universe. OK, so let's um, I'm going to show you now one of my favorite opening scenes from a film, okay? Uh, I don't know if you can, uh, I hope this is coming through all right. Maybe Mr. Nettle, you can tell me if there's any problems with this. I'm turning the sound off though. Ah, sorry, there we go. Right, I'm gonna go. Okay, so here uh, we are close to the earth, okay? And we're just zooming away. And the first um, object that you'll see is obviously the moon. Now, the moon is very, very close to us, okay? Um, so much so than anything else, okay? So much so than anything else. It's, it's important to appreciate that, okay? The moon is literally like your back garden, right? Or the back garden of it. It's that, it's that, that near, okay? Uh, now, we, we zoom further out, and this planet there, is Mars, I'm sure you got that. Ah, in between Mars now and Jupiter, did you see what that was? That was the asteroid belt. And you think, is that another planet? No, it's not. It is in fact a moon. It's a moon of Jupiter. Now Jupiter has got many, many moons and an important feature of the solar system which you need to grasp is that, um, you know, the Earth isn't the only planet with a moon. OK, we call it the moon, don't we? But there are lots of moons uh, around different planets. And, you know, uh, yeah, and it tends to be the case that the larger planets are, the more moons they have. But not always, not always. Jupiter there, lots of moons. Zoom a little bit further out again. Saturn. Go through the rings of Saturn there. And now you'll notice, you see how the sun is starting to get very small at this distance now, and it's starting to look a bit like, the sun is starting to look, ah, pause, it's starting to look a bit like just another star in the universe, because we're getting that far away. Now you'll also notice as well, is this circular structure, um, seemingly at a great distance around the sun, that's called the Oort cloud, right? Oh, hello, who are these guys? Right, now these are the nearest stars 
to um, our solar system. They call Alpha and Proxima Centauri, or Centauri. It depends on, on you know, it depends on how you, where you where you're educated as to where whether or not you say Centauri or Centauri. Um, these are um, approximately six light years away. So now, instead of using the term astronomical units, I started using the term light years. And let's just just spend a, a brief moment to think about what that means. Six light years away. So that means it takes the light from those stars six years to get to us. When you look at Alpha and Proxima Centauri, you are actually looking at them as they were six years ago, because the light that you're receiving at this moment from those stars has been traveling for six years. So you're seeing how they were in the past, okay? You keep on zooming out. And now you start to see these kind of strange structures. What's going on here? It's like a huge cloud, and it is a cloud. It's a big cloud of dust and gas, huge cloud of dust and gas. And in fact, um, this is a depiction of one of the most famous clouds of dust and gas. Um, these are called or referred to as the pillars of creation. But what you need to know is a big cloud of dust or gas is known as a nebula. I'm right, more on that a little bit now, in a, a little bit later on. This is called a nebula. And we keep on zooming out. We see lots of stars now. Oh, there are lots of stars now. In fact, that's a star forming region. We keep on zooming out. And now we see this structure. Now, this structure here, I wonder if anyone knows what that is or what it's called. All right. And again, it'd be great if someone put uh, an answer in the chat. That would that would mean a lot to myself and Mr. Neckel. It really would. Um, but this structure is, in fact, our galaxy. And it is a collection of billions upon billions of stars. There's approximately three to four hundred billion stars in this galaxy. One thing I wanted to wrap your head around as well is that bright glowing orb in the center isn't like a, a giant star or something. It's the it's the collective light from billions upon billions of stars. OK, uh, that sounds a bit like Brian Cox, then. not it? Billions upon billions of stars. Um, so, yeah, that's our galaxy. All right. Called the Milky Way. And it is just one galaxy. So wrap your heads around this. This is a small globular cluster galaxy close by. And coming into shot now is our, oh, this is the nearest galaxy to us. This is called Andromeda. OK, so this is our nearest neighboring galaxy, which we're due to collide within a couple of billion years, which should be fun. But it is, um, again, a very similar size. OK, and um, again, containing uh, hundreds of billions of stars. And importantly now, when we zoom out even further, what we see is that the universe is filled with galaxies, each galaxy containing hundreds of billions of stars. And in fact, there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. Hundreds of billions of galaxies, each containing hundreds of billions of stars. There are more galaxies in the universe, there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on Earth. Scary statistic. The other thing is, is it makes you realize you're not really that special either. Sorry to say, kid, but you're not. Because imagine going down to the beach and picking up a grain of sand and going, oh, look at that. That's amazing. Just wouldn't do it, but do. But that is how significant the sun is. Sorry. Right, let's see if we can get off here now. Let uh, me get out of here. Go on to the next one. There we go. All right. If you've got time, have a look at the slideshow. There's also another video on the size of planets comparison and star comparison as well. I, I, I urge you to have a look at that. But for now, we are going to just talk about these structures. Then, can you put the following structures in the correct order? When we just did that video, now so you should be able to have an idea of where most of these go. Okay. So the smallest structure on this list here is the Earth. Put the number one next to that. Um, then it would be the solar system. And then it would be a galaxy. 
Uh, you haven't heard of this one yet. This is called local group. I threw, in, threw that one in there as a bit of a red herring, right? Now, the local group is a local cluster of galaxies. So that's like a cluster of galaxies. And then all of these things are contained within the universe. So the universe is all of the space and stars and galaxies, okay? The universe is the space which contains everything. Right. There's some distances, again, um, have a look at those maybe uh, when you access the slideshow yourself. And I think we've done those two now. We have talked about uh, terrestrial planets, check, um, gaseous planets, giant planets, dwarf planets, comets, moons, asteroids. Uh, we've done the features of the observable universe, planets, planetary systems, stars and galaxies. Um, we know what these mean, astronomical unit, average distance between the Earth and um, the Sun, and light years. Okay. Oh, just to give you some kind of flavour of how much bigger a light year is as well. The Earth is about, the light takes eight minutes to get from the Sun to the Earth. All right, so that tells you how close we are to the Sun in a way. Um, and of course, the light from Alpha and Proxima Centauri take six light years to get you. All right, so, you know, eight minutes as opposed to six years is a quite a significant difference. And by the way, the other thing I didn't mention as well is that the the galaxy, the Milky Way, is about 100,000 light years across. So I'm just going to let you think about that for a second. That's pretty big. OK, drop down. So now we're going to move on to um, the main observable stages in the life cycle of stars. OK, now stars, like people, they have a start, a middle and an end. All right. So they have a birth, a main part of their life, and then they have, um, sadly, an end. OK. So all stars, first of all, are formed out of a star forming nebula. And I showed you an image of this just now, really, when we looked at that video. And um, these are known as the pillar of, pil pillars of creation. And they're just large clouds of hydrogen gas and other elements mixed in there, right? That's all you need. It's the only ingredient you need, OK, to make a star. You know, you're making a cake, you need lots of ingredients. Make a star, you just need hydrogen. And this image is a very famous image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, and it's an incredible image because it actually shows stars being born in these large clouds of gas. It's pretty incredible stuff. And yes, kids, that's real. It looks like it's uh, um, been drawn or made up, but that is in fact real. OK, so that's the first part of the life cycle of a star. I've got the whole answer here, and we're going we're gonna to go through it step by step. OK, um, so the force of gravity then pulls all that gas together, right? That's what we've got here, the force of gravity. The nebula pulls the gas together until it forms a hot ball of gas known as a protostar. So the first sort of stage is not really a full star, it's a protostar, it's like, um, it's like a teenager, if you like, it hasn't really completely grown up yet. But when it gets hot enough, and when it gets dense enough, when the gravity pulls that star together with enough force, when the pressure builds up and the heat builds up, this magical thing starts happening called nuclear fusion, OK? And nuclear fusion pr produces a huge amount of energy, and it is, the, it is the energy source that is responsible for all life on Earth, OK? And it's, it's what causes all the stars to shine. Um, and once the star starts, or the core of the star, the centre of the star, because it starts undergoing nuclear fusion, it moves on to what we call the main sequence then, or the main part of its life, okay? So we're going to look at now, um, yeah, sun-like stars first, okay? Now, the first stage for massive stars and sun-like stars is pretty much the same. So what does a, sta a stable main sequence in stars look like? Well, you've got two forces, all right? One that you're quite familiar with. So the first one you've got is uh, gravity. And gravity, like on Earth right now is pushing you, or pulling you rather, sorry, towards the centre, okay? So you've got gravity pulling you towards the centre, and you've got gravity holding the star together, or if you like, pushing it inwards, all right, pulling it inwards. And then you've got this other force, which you'll have not heard before, actually pushing out. And this is called uh, radiation pressure, okay? This is called radiation pressure pushing outwards. 
And when those two forces are balanced, you think about what, what, what Mr. Nettle did last week with forces. When those forces are balanced, when they're equal and not opposite, then Newton's first law applies, really, right? The forces cancel each other out. And the star will remain stable and it will stay like that for billions of years. Okay? Billions of years while those two forces are balanced, okay? Um, so in the case of the sun, uh, it's got a total lifespan we estimate to be about 10 billion years and it's about halfway through the stable part of its life okay uh, so but eventually stars will form red giants that's an image of a red giant there okay but stars will form red giants so what's that all about essentially the star uses up all of the hydrogen in its core it then it, it fuses hydrogen into helium that's nuclear fusion so nuclear fusion is the the process which is converting hydrogen into helium and releasing loads amounts of, loads of energy but it starts to run out of that hydrogen and then it starts to fuse together heavier elements and it gets really hot in the core and it starts to push cause it to expand right when you heat the gas it tends to expand okay and that heat causes the star to swell up and form what we call a red giant and it will go to many 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 times um, its original size. In fact, when the sun comes to the end of its lifespan, it will swell up to such a size that it will engulf not just Mercury, not just Venus, but also Mar but also the Earth as well. Okay, Martians might be safe. We don't. We're not sure. So, uh, what happens next? Well, those outer layers we get. Well, at the next stage and after red giant is in fact a planetary nebula. Planetary nebula is where the outer layers of that red giant just drift off slowly into space. Okay, and you get these lovely, lovely images, right? So um, here are just a few of my favourite planetary nebula. We've all got them. So um, this planetary nebula, you can see that the the outer layers of the red giant have drifted off into space, and just at the centre, you can see what's left over. See this guy? I wonder if anyone knows what that's called. Check it in the chat if you know what it's called. Okay. Put it in there if you know what it's called. The thing that's left then is the white hot core of the star, which we call a white dwarf. All right. And that would be what is left over. The only thing, the only remnant of stars like our sun, sun like stars. Uh, here is another planetary nebula. Quite a good looking one. I think you'll agree. And uh, the difference is, though, at the center of here, you'll notice it's not actually a white dwarf. This is a red dwarf. All right, and really a white dwarf after Louis. Down. Sorry, kids. Lan, call the dog. The um the white um the white core of the star will cool, okay, and it will form a, a red dwarf. All right, and eventually that will fade even further. And it will call, and it will turn into a, a brown dwarf, and then eventually fade from from vision. Okay, and um, yeah, we've got other planetary nebula, uh, and that's it, really. That's that's what will happen to a sun-like star. But we're going to look now at the life cycle of massive stars. What happens to a star which is, you know, one and a half times the size of the sun and greater? Well, first bit's the same, like we said. So stars. Uh, are formed out of you know nebula gases collapse under gravity and form stars and the main sequence part is the same radiation pressure outwards balanced by gravity inwards okay um, but large stars have much shorter lifespan so you might think oh you know it's a larger star it lasts longer it doesn't work like that the rate of fusion in the core is much much faster because of all the extra and um, pressure and gravity okay now, when these stars um, uh, get uh, the end of their main sequence, they form what we call a, a red supergiant, which is the same as a red giant, except it's just got the word super in front of it. But there's a massive difference to what happens to a massive star <laughs> uh, and a main and a, a sun-like star, and that is that whereas with the, the sun-like star, those outer layers drifted off into space. Remember, I said they drifted off into space to form planetary nebula. Now the the gravity of the core is so strong that it pulls all that stuff in, and all that matter, okay, and all that um, outer atmosphere of the star collapses in 
and the bounds off the core and causes an enormous explosion, right? And when that happens, it doesn't just cause a, a huge explosion, but it also creates a lot of very, very heavy elements. Very, very heavy elements. Now, here is a famous image. In fact, you can probably seen this image before. I think um, for those of you, maybe you have a, a MacBook or you've seen a MacBook. This is usually a, a, a wallpaper sometimes you see on there. Remember I mentioned Andromeda earlier on? Andromeda, Andromeda being our nearest neighboring galaxy. Okay. Well, this is an image taken of Andromeda. And it shows, okay, um, a supernova event, right? That happened just here. All right. This was a supernova. All right. And it was so bright, okay, that it outshone the entire galaxy for a few days, which is pretty incredible. So it was so bright that it actually outshone the whole galaxy for a while. Um, here are some of my favorite uh, supernova remnants. We've got the famous crab nebula there. I don't know what that one's called, but it looks cool. Um, yeah, again, what a fun image that is. You notice that they're a little bit more, um, they're a little bit more volatile and chaotic compared to the nice round planetary nebula. Um, and there we go. All right. Now, what's left now is where before we had a white dwarf for a sun-like star. Now, um, the gravity and the density of the core is so large that it forms a neutron star, which is this crazy crazy substance made entirely of neutrons it's pretty cool i know that doesn't sound that impressive but the density of it is the same as an atomic nucleus the density of it um if you were to get like a teaspoon of it it would weigh as much as like 10 aircraft carriers or something crazy like that right it's very very dense um but even more interesting if, if something is if, if a star was greater than three times the size of our sun to begin with then it will form a black hole and to be honest with kids, I, I could talk about black holes for a considerable amount of time. Um, but I I'll just give you the really fast version, I suppose. The, the gravity is so strong that it pulls the surface of the a neutron star inwards and inwards and inwards. And when that happens, um, the force of gravity gets larger and larger and larger, the smaller it gets, and then the gravity becomes infinite and the object becomes um vanishingly small and um I, I we probably should move on now but it, it basically it's a black hole because its gravity is so strong that not even light can escape so that's why we call it a, a black hole right um there's an image of a, a a black hole feeding that's not a real image by the way that's an artist's impression of a black hole ripping another star to pieces but we've seen evidence of this so uh, in the in uh the galaxy M87, we've seen this incredible event where there's this enormous jet of matter protruding from the galaxy, hundreds of thousands of light years long. And, you know, um, it, we astronomers are pretty convinced that that's a, a feed in black hole. How sinister. Two years ago, 2019, the first ever image of a black hole was taken. Well done, humans. So that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and again, it's an interesting topic in and of itself, but we're running out of time, okay? Um, and last thing I'll say about black holes is, you know, in the last sort of 15 years or so, we've discovered that um, there are black holes in the center of galaxies. Um, and in fact, uh, we've discovered there's a black hole in the center of our own galaxy, a super massive black hole at the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And this is, a, this is an image of our own galaxy as viewed from Earth. It's an image of the Milky Way, and if you ever get the opportunity to get away from the street lamps and the the city lights and get out into the out into the wilderness, if you get a clear night, you'll see something quite incredible, just like this. Brecon beacons, amazing place to go. And that is the life cycle of supermassive um, stars. Then, okay, um, remember now they can become two things at the end. They could become a neutron star after a supernova, or it could become black hole. All the information is on the PowerPoint anyway for you to um, synthesize and, and uh, digest at your leisure. So let's look at where we're at now. Yeah, we're happy with all those things. Uh, we've got uh, just about a minute left, so I'm going to try and go through the last one or two now. Um, I don't suppose there's another lesson on, so it's probably okay if I run over by a minute or so.
the origin of the solar system from the collapse of a cloud of gas and dust, including elements injected in supernovae. Right. So um, an amazing thing about our um, our solar system is not only was it formed out of a large nebula, a large cloud of dust and gas, and here we've got another star forming region, but our solar system also contains a lot of heavy elements. So, for example, um, the Earth's core is made of um, predominantly iron. We found we find an enormous abundance of uranium, the heaviest element that we know in the Earth's crust. There are elements way, way, way too heavy to be formed in just net regular normal stars. So we know that our solar system is formed out of the remnants of a supernova. Um, because the only way to create those heavy elements is in that incredible cataclysmic event. That's the only way you can create those really heavy elements. And in fact, such is the abundance of uranium and heavy elements like uranium, such as the abundance that we actually know that it's likely that it's not just the case that our solar system was created of the remnants of a supernova, but in fact, it's probably more likely that our solar system was created of the remnants of a supernova, which was actually created out of a remnant of a star that went before it. So we're probably like third generation. All right. Now, kids, you know, I can't tell you you're special you are special but i can tell you you made from stardust which is kind of cool all right um we'll have to um probably leave it there now but just quickly on the hertzsprung russell diagram for those who are doing higher tier ever so quickly all right it's a graph that shows uh luminosity which is just brightness and temperature so here we've got cooler stars this is cooler and obviously this way is hotter all right, and this is uh, brighter. OK, and what it shows is the main sequence of stars in the middle here. All right, stars on the stable part of their life. When stars come to the end of their life, they end up going up here to become uh, red giants. All right, when they swell up, they become cooler and brighter because they get much bigger. And then uh, for sun-like stars, they end up becoming white dwarfs down here, which are hot. See, they're down here, so they're hot, but they're not very bright because they're so small. Um, or um, we get, um, I say, neutron stars are black holes. So though, though that's just the diagram, and you might have to look at the root, OK? Um, anyway, so. Um, we're going to leave it there. I haven't got time for past paper questions, but um, as I say, they're on the PowerPoint and you will be able to try them at your leisure. Uh, and I'm sure if you just watch this again uh, or look at your notes, I'm sure there won't be any problems for you. I uh, I hope um, that was useful to you guys. Um, as I say, I could talk about these things all day, but I've already taken enough of your time. So um, if you, uh, if you, I hope you, I hope you enjoy that. I don't know if there were any questions, Mr. Nettle. Um, there were a couple of answers, especially with the astronomical units. It was good to see someone got in before you answered it with the distance between the sun and Earth. You just added the average bit, so that was good to see. Nicely done, kids. Yeah, but there's not much chat today. All right, no worries. OK, uh, well, um, thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, I guess we'll we'll end it there then.